This session, as you know, is on philanthropy, the catalyst for change. Uh, I'd like to give a little bit of a backdrop. First, in the spirit of the global conference, you'll notice that our panel is quite global. We have uh, just one American participant in addition to myself. I want to first thank all, all of the bios are in the materials you've received, so we won't waste any time going over those. But I do want to reach out and thank Tsitsi Maserwa, who's agreed to step in last minute uh, on behalf of Stephen Klubeck, who had a family emergency and couldn't join us. Uh, Titi is a dear friend, and I put her to work significantly since she got here <laughs> on Saturday. Uh, so this is her third panel, but thank you very much for being here. So framing the issue of philanthropy, uh, we at the Institute have a Center for Strategic Philanthropy where we try to advise in a cause agnostic way uh, people that are interested in developing efficacy metrics and thinking smartly about their philanthropy. We find that often people who have made enormous fortunes in their business lives actually don't apply those same principles to their giving strategies. Sometimes people feel it's distasteful to have expectations uh, and then are resultingly disappointed in the outcomes. So we're really hoping to get to scale, energize capital towards uh, intention that can be best suited to change. And we find that in the United States today, there's 1.6 million nonprofit organizations. If that phenomenon existed in the for-profit space, somebody would come in, a wave of M&A would sweep through, strip out the associated expenses, and, and uh, target more dollars towards the cause. So one of the things is that we're not afraid to address is the ego of philanthropy. You know, oftentimes people are willing to establish foundations, uh, typically at the result of some transaction that results in an enormous amount of liquidity. Tax advisors come in. Uh, and yet they don't really, in the United States, help you craft your philanthropic vision quite as well as, as they might. So we're really thinking about you know, how can we think more strategically about philanthropy generally. Uh, we also are looking at a world where half of the countries on the planet, given the birth rates, are facing declining populations, and the other half are exponentially growing. And the half that's growing is the half without the associated infrastructure to create sustainable environments for that level of population. So we want to, uh, first I'd like to turn to you, Fallen Rocho. Uh, you have focused a lot of your philanthropic activity on the empowerment of women and girls, uh, a theme that you will see particularly uh, at the conference today with the lunch, which I encourage all of you to attend. So tell us, um, one, your, your strategy around that, and secondly, what is the importance of that empowerment relative to the cure of some of the ills facing the countries in which you're working? Um, we are really, uh, we've been empowering widows and orphans. Um, and widows uh, have been facing deprivation, they have been facing dehumanization, and they've been facing uh, isolation, and uh, all sorts of things. We could go on and on. And there are like 245 million of them around the world. Um, and then their children, about 500 million around the world. Um, ours is faith-based, and we've been um, helping out since 2008. Uh, when we started out, we initially wanted to uh, just give them money, give them financial aid. But that didn't seem to be logical, because once they spend that, then they're going to come back and ask for more. So we changed our minds, and we decided that we're going to give them, uh, teach them how to fish, rather than give them fish. And uh, we find that that works, because then they would pay back. We give them a long time within which to pay back. And uh, they, 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 we, when they finish paying, they can come back for more money. And uh, we monitor that. And when we give them more money, it's more than what they were given in the first place. So that way, we're able to monitor uh, their, their progress um, with their various businesses. And we found that that works a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to give them uh, the aid, definitely they're going to spend the money and they're going to come back for more. Uh, we find that uh, the numbers in Africa are enormous. And uh, philanthropy in Africa is uh, pretty uh, uh, young, I would say. In the past, the culture has always been to just reach out to uh, those amongst your family mm. that are in need. 
and uh, they look around to their family members that are well off or that have more money than them, uh, whatever the case may be. And they know that uh, they won't send them away empty handed, whatever the case may be, they'll still help them out. Um, some get uh, help through um, the education of their children or just to put food on the tables. But um, we thank God that uh, philanthropy has been moving to Africa now and uh, more people, uh, more NGOs are springing up and uh, the NGOs, uh, many of them are focused in different areas. But as I said, ours is for widows and orphans and uh, we're, we're, we're learning lessons as we go along. Great. So I, I like the idea of the recyclability of capital as opposed to just a one-time mm -hmm. unidirectional flow. And Tom, uh, one of the things that I always tell people as, as they're thinking about this is good intention does not give you a pass from fiscal responsibility. And I know that you feel the same way. So tell us about some of the accountability metrics that you've established through the Hunter Foundation and some kind of initial successes and failures. Yeah, I mean, it, it, good morning, everybody. Um, I think um, on trying to learn about philanthropy because we are on this journey of learning so I mean we're it's definitely work in progress for us that's the first thing we're to say. Help you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Rich and um, we had the great pleasure of meeting with um, Muhammad Yunus um, from Grameen and he basically educated us that um, if you just wanted to write a check that was great um, but it was a one-off and as you say, people were going to come back um, for more. So he really encouraged us to think about um, the social business, where the business gets to profitability, which means sustainability, but it keeps on giving. So that, that really struck me because my only field of reference is business, and therefore um, that was something that really struck a chord with me if we could invest in social businesses because I was I was really I was really st struck by not wanting to create more dependency mm -hmm. um, where we're from in in Scotland I was explaining to Adam you know our uh, we have a very rich history of entrepreneurship we gave the world the telephone the TV Andrew Carnegie <laughs> um, the, the founding father of modern philanthropy. But our near history has been one of dependency. Where I'm from was deep coal mining, which was government owned, um, steel making, government owned, and shipbuilding, government owned. But, but guess what? Today, no deep coal mining, no steel making, very little shipbuilding. So therefore, in Scotland, what we're trying to do is, is recreate this entrepreneurial culture and get away from the dependency. So we really believe in giving people a hand up and not a hand out. Really firmly, passionately, aggressively believe in that. And therefore, um, when we invest, and we do see it as an investment, we want a return and we want to measure how we're doing. So if, if, if we were giving um, an NGO um, money, we would agree with them what success looks like. We would agree milestones, so if it was a three-year project, we would agree milestones 6, 12, 18, 24 months. And, and we would measure, and there's some tough conversations, you know, because if, if, if they are not performing and delivering what they said they would by 12 months, you know, we have a couple of options. We I can think one of the interesting things that you've done is you've actually allocated monies from the foundation towards measurement. Yeah. Um, every investment we do, at least 5% of it goes to outside measurement. So it's not us saying how we're doing. We go to a third party who very, um, you know, they're, they're very tough. Now, um, some people um, have said that's too hard-headed. But I think I mentioned it the other day, I, I, a very good friend of mine says, look, he who has the pesos has the say-sos. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, we get a lot of stick for. Um, but I just, I think it's 
so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our business life, we wouldn't write a check and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And this is mm -hmm. more important mm -hmm. than what mm -hmm. we do in business. Mm -hmm. So why would we write a check and hope for the best? Cheerio, thank you. <laughs> you know, it just... It's not but you'd be surprised at how many people yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not in my Scottish DNA. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. And uh, <clears throat> let's go to Adam for a moment, because I, I think there's an interesting idea about applying those business principles to philanthropy, and it works in reverse sometimes. You actually, at Cornerstone On Demand, have a Cornerstone Foundation. Uh, so corporate philanthropy can play a role as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so when we started the, the Cornerstone On Demand Foundation, our belief was that we shouldn't limit it to giving away money. We should leverage our whole ecosystem that we had built over a decade and a half. And so we decided to focus on three sectors, education, workforce development, disaster relief. And as we got into the humanitarian aid area, it became very apparent that there was no consistency about how humanitarian aid workers were enabled to do their work and that there was no unified way of doing organizational capacity building for the whole sector. And there were about 250,000 humanitarian aid workers out there on the formal roles. And we decided to put everything against that objective. So we leveraged our software, our services, our employees, but also our partners and our clients and got them all to become part of this initiative, we created essentially a nonprofit called DisasterReady.org, which brought together the top humanitarian aid organizations out there, everyone from the UN to World Vision, Oxfam, Save the Children, the Red Cross, and many others, to convene them to help us build the, the training and the materials and the best practices that were used by these people our initial goal was to roll this out to 30,000 of the humanitarian aid workers within the first year. And within 15 months, we were at about 50,000 of the 250. So our goal now is to roll this ultimately to all 250,000 people and become a source of ongoing training, development, best practice around things like personal safety, sanitation, uh, protection of children, and the like to make all these humanitarian aid workers more effective in the work that they do. Great. I think the important thing you said there was uh, upon establishing the foundation, you honed in on a strategy. There were three concentrated areas. Too often people uh, just respond to incoming requests without really thinking strategically about it. So there's a strategy and then a tactical component. The tactical component today should be leveraging technology. I mean, there are today 600 million unique Facebook users a month figuring out some way to tap into a minuscule percentage of those people can really be quite scalable. So I want to stay on that technology theme for a moment and go to you, Tsitsi, because you have um, leveraged technology in a way that has allowed you to reach literally thousands of students uh, in Africa. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I want to start by saying when we started the foundation, um, we didn't make money and then start uh, philanthropic work. We started philanthropic work with no money. It was a vision that we had that one day when we do have money, we do it uh, at a much larger scale. So once we started, the resources became available, we didn't really have a plan. We just went into the schools. We focused on orphaned children, went into the schools, talked to the headmasters, identified, they identified for us where the children were, and we literally took names down amount of school fees, and then sent a check. So that's how we started. Uh, despite the fact that I, you know, I come from a business background, we have investments in you know, family, uh, in, in my husband is an entrepreneur, but we kind of like separated the two and went in really with our feelings and our emotions and did a lot of good. But in the process, uh, what we found was the need to step back and ask ourselves, is this the most effective way in which we can use the limited resources that we have? And are we really giving a deserving service to the beneficiaries? So uh, it took a number of years. So in a period of uh, 18 years, we've given access to education to uh, more than 200,000 children, primary school education, high school, tertiary. And 
when I look at the figures on the primary school um, uh, level, the pass rate, national, we primarily work in Zimbabwe, um, Burundi and Lesotho, but the figures for Zimbabwe, when we looked at the pass rate, the government pass rate uh, national was 37% for primary school. Ours was 34%. We obviously focused on children that were really, uh, you know, you're really socially and economically distressed. But that, you know, looking at those figures got us thinking, why do we have a disconnect between what the company does and what the foundation does? How do we ensure that the child that we are um, giving assistance through, through the education, uh, through the scholarships, not only has access, but we go to the next level of influencing the quality of education that they have. Technology allows us at a very low cost to be able to do that. So we've learned another lesson. In philanthropy, you need to talk to governments, you need to work with them. You know, much as it's your money and it's your call, uh, you still need to understand the, part, part, you, you, the importance of partnership. The government is an important partner. The community is an important partner. If the community doesn't understand what you're trying to do, <coughs> the buy-in is very limited and your results are also uh, uh, affected in a negative sense. So we went back and began to talk to the headmasters and the teachers and the children to understand what can we do to not only improve on, ac on access but on quality. And the realization that we well, have, have a proper strategy what ask, we asked ourselves, what role does technology play in improving the quality? And the opportunities we saw were, number one, we could rewrite the school syllabus, which hadn't been revised since 1980. So you can imagine the kids are learning on paper what mm -hmm. I learned when, I don't 1980, many, many years ago. Uh, also, the teachers, uh, most of the teachers are in the rural areas or if they're in the townships, they don't have exposure. When they're talking about computers, most had never actually seen a computer. You're talking about a tablet, so when you talk practical issues like, okay, how does water, water system run in a home? The kids have no clue, neither, neither does the teacher. When she talks about boreholes, she has to draw it on a board to draw a borehole. And, you know, I don't know about your teacher, I don't think mine would have been able to draw, to draw a borehole <laughs> on a board. But so by taking the syllabus and repackaging it and enriching it, we've been able to really give access to quality uh, education, working hand in hand with the teacher for the child to experience a, an enriched uh, um, uh, syllabus that is more practical and that is more relevant to, uh, to what they, they need. What we've also done is to um, take uh, s textbooks, negotiate with uh, publishers, and put on a tablet uh, university textbooks, because you can imagine the cost of a textbook in a developing country for an engineering student, a science student. We sponsor um, medical uh, um, students at uh, the university. We've given, um, sponsored more than 350. And they had a problem of expensive textbooks. So we solved that by putting all those uh, textbooks on a tablet, so that allows the student for a small fee to be able to use that uh, uh, information for the period that they are at a university and then after that you hand back your tablet and the next uh, group of students makes use of that. So the vast, there are vast opportunities that we've really been able to identify. And like I said, we haven't really seen increases in the budget. What has happened is we've seen greater efficiency in the way we use money. Well, and technology should be affording that efficiency yeah. as well. But as you mentioned, you, you really do need to leverage into the established infrastructure in governments, in schools, et cetera. So, Paul and Rocho, tell us uh, what kind of partnership initiatives have you undertaken and which ones do you think work and which ones haven't worked so well? Well, we're looking forward to um, uh, being able to source the right kind of partnerships uh, to get into, to be able to provide uh, health um, initiatives and services for, for the widows and the orphans because we find that uh, lots of them die from stress. Uh, their husbands die from uh, high blood pressure, trying to you know, put food on the table for, the, for their families. 
and then you don't want that happening to to the widows and then you're left with a, a lot a lot of orphans because we also cater for orphans so the, if we can you know take care of their of their health issues uh, which we can't provide because uh, we're self-funded we don't get money from any other source mm -hmm. it's just from you know uh, from within um, we're looking for partners that can provide those kind of service, services uh, for our widows and our orphans. Uh, we're looking for partnerships uh, in technology uh, to be able to uh, leapfrog uh, development in, um, in, in, in Nigeria. Um, we are about to start off uh, uh, to set up a, a vocations, uh, vocation skills center and a hostel for them and uh, to uh, provide uh, head headquarters because that wasn't the initial thing that we, that we felt was most important. What was most important for us when we were starting out was to at least get them to be able to put food on their tables for their children. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've gone through that phase. Uh, so the next phase um, was uh, to begin to get government, uh, the attention of government, so I wrote a book called uh, The Cry of Widows and Orphans and uh, sent it to Senate and uh, various uh, governmental agencies to try and get their attention, to let them know what these people are suffering because it seems as if they're the, the f forgotten, forgotten lot of the society because uh, it, it's, it's very easy for other, others to move on with their lives and forget that there are others that are suffering. So I wrote that book and we sent it all over, uh, uh, you know, the various government agencies. It was like, a, you know, knocking on their doors to say, hey, listen, there are these people in, within the society that need your attention. Um, we uh, celebrate, for, we, we've been doing it for the last two years, uh, the, the, the Widow's Day. Uh, and uh, celebration of the Widow's Day, we get uh, in touch with uh, village heads, community heads, uh, because uh, when um, the husbands of uh, these women die, uh, one of the first things that happens to them is that they get evicted from, mm. from their marital homes. Um, if uh, village heads and community heads can make sure that they're protected in some ways, it's not that there aren't laws. There are laws, but those laws aren't being effectively uh, 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 put to good use. They're not being enforced. So whoever is... Um, uh, uh, dealing with them in so many uh, negative ways. They don't get punished, so they get away with it. Uh, so if we get the buy-in of the, of the village heads and community heads, then maybe that, some of that can stop. Because when that can stop, then not, there won't be so many of them on the streets, sleeping on street corners and uh, churches and what have you. Uh, that gives us less headache and you know, less numbers out there. So um, getting into partnerships uh, for us is key because we don't have the technology, we can't provide it. Uh, what we provide uh, for, 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 for the widows is empowerment and that is uh, the uh, um, interest-free microcredits. And for their children, uh, we give them scholarships to um, tertiary level. And the orphans, you know, we go all out to give them accommodation because they wouldn't have anywhere else to go. Uh, and uh, you know, we give them uh, scholarships all the way to university. And uh, one of the ways that we measure uh, 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 that, that we measure what we've done so far is that by the time they've come out of school, we know that yes, we've achieved our aim and objective, and that is that we have given them uh, the opportunity to be able to stand on their own two feet because then they can go, go out and look for jobs and uh, be able to help themselves from that point on. Mm -hmm. Because we can't do everything. I mean, there are all sorts of NGOs all over the place. Uh, each one decides what they want to focus on and then maybe another NGO will take them up from there and provide whatever else they need to provide them with in life. Um, and then the, the widows, as I said earlier on, um, the micro credits do help them. They look forward to it. Uh, it, it's it's uh, boosted their ego, uh, given them more confidence uh, that they're doing something for their families, and uh, it, we, we, we're learning. We're learning as as, as we go along. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's schools. important to push that learning across. And yes. these ideas of microcredit and impact investing, no, no one was speaking about this 20, 25 years ago mm. in the space mm. of philanthropy. Mm. It was, so I think I like, if everyone can think of it in terms of historic passive money, which is check writing and to Tom's point, you know, here you go, mm. thank you. And then more activist expectation driven money today. Mm. And I think in order to do that, you really need to impart some innovation into philanthropy. And I've seen that uh, as dreadfully missing in the space. Uh, the author, Dale Doughton, who's a friend of mine, uh, has spent a lot of his academic research on innovation. And he said, uh, different isn't always better, but better is always different. <laughs> so you really need to kind of think through what that strategy is. So from an innovation perspective, Tom, what, what in the organizations with which you've engaged, What's been the most innovative strategy that you've seen? Well, I think in, in um, Scotland, we, our whole thing is about pilot, prove, adopt. And um, first of all, governments don't like to take risks and governments don't like to be seen to be failing. So in Scotland, we went to the government and said, OK, <clears throat> let's pilot this. If it fails, it's us. If it works, it's you. Um, but the price for that is that once we do prove it, you will adopt it as policy because I don't want to be a substitute for the taxpayer. And um, we had some successes with that in education um, because, again, especially in education, governments are very um, risk averse, as, as they probably should be. And, um, but we don't mind <coughs> failing, you know. If we're failing, at least we're trying. And um, so getting the government to think that way, I think, was a bit of an innovation. <laughs> sure. um, and then the governments change, and then you've got to start all over again, and different people have different ideas, and you know, but it, you can't give up. So I think getting the government for this pilot prove adopt was an innovation in, in primary education, which we were very very proud of. So that one worked. Um, there's plenty of failures, yep. <laughs> which I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet, but we have time. <laughs> See, Adam, same question. Tell me, only from your perspective, I want to know something that, because your business is all about innovation. So what business principle have you applied to your philanthropy? So I would say that sometimes innovation and philanthropy is common sense in business. And the best example I could give you is what we did in the, the food allergy area. So this was more not from the corporate foundation, <laughs> but from our family foundation. And we uh, got very involved with a food allergy organization. So today, food allergies afflict about one out of 13 kids in the States. The incidence has doubled in the last 10 years. And if you go into any preschool in the US, two to three kids in the preschool have severe food allergies today, which was non-existent when I went to preschool, for example. Uh, so I got very involved with one organization that was called FAN, very active in food allergy. Turned out that there were several of these organizations, to your point, 1.6 million nonprofits. Two of them were fairly prominent. One did a lot of grassroots work, which was FAN, based in DC very effective at, at driving awareness, but didn't do much in the research area. Another organization was based in New York called FAI, very effective at fundraising, doing big galas, giving money to research, but did almost nothing from a grassroots perspective. So as I got involved with the organization, I said, this makes absolutely no sense. This should be one organization. Turned out that the, you talked about ego and philanthropy, you have social entrepreneurs as well as corporate entrepreneurs. The social entrepreneurs viewed each other as competitors and didn't like each other. And so there was a lot of ill will that had formed over the years between these two organizations that had both been around for at least a decade. Uh, I brokered through shuttle diplomacy basically a merger between these two organizations. <laughs> and we created a third new organization called FAIR, brought in a new CEO, essentially doubled the budget of each organization because they were about the same size, reduced, uh, there were synergies obviously, and 
there was almost no overlap in the fundraising. One was grassroots based, one was high net worth donor based. But we started looking at the research we had done and realized that uh, there were a lot of doctors who had been around the country doing interesting work and around the world doing interesting work on desensitization to food allergies through oral immunotherapy. But they were all in what's considered a phase one clinical trial. They were just trying it out with their patients. They were doing it differently with different organizations and there was no way that it was ever going to get commercialized or get through the FDA. So we decided to create a for-profit pharmaceutical company because we couldn't interest any of the big pharma companies to get involved in this because we considered at the time an orphaned issue. So we started a pharma company. Uh, separate story later is that you know, I, I gave the seed money from my side through the family foundation, got yelled at by the tax guys and everybody else that you would never use foundation money to fund an investment in a for-profit entity because if it failed, you would get no tax benefit for it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we ended up forming this company. Within 18 months, they were able to raise a very large round of funding on top of a round of funding we had raised. That investment has returned 700% already. Did not cash out, but we now are moving into a, had able to get through the phase two trial and about to move into a phase three trial this company will likely go public in the next year and will probably be able to commercialize something that had no chance of commercialization two years ago by having a for-profit entity. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that investment also was partially funded by the, the new nonprofit we created and brought $7 million into that nonprofit that wasn't expected. So a boon for the nonprofit and still that nonprofit has half the equity it had in the for-profit <coughs> organization. So a very holistic approach yeah. to dealing with the problem. And I think the, the interesting thing is that's financially innovative, right? And I, if you look at the example today of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, the idea of venture philanthropy, can, can philanthropic capital be the risk capital mm. that can catalyze a movement going mm -hmm. forward? So for those of you that don't know, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation created a portfolio essentially of private equity investments in early stage but promising technologies and therapies, uh, one of which ended up developing a drug ca called Kaleidico, which is quite effective in, in a small percentage of CF patients, but then sold off the royalty stream and had a $3 billion infusion into the foundation. So the idea of what role philanthropic capital mm. can play mm. is changing. Again, back from that kind of historic check writing to let's be a little bit more adventurous and venture some. So, so Titi. Um, no, no surprise, but that was our model, actually, yes. when we did this, was the CF Foundation. Was using that. Right. Yeah. Rich, uh, sorry, before you ask me the question, I just wanted to, to highlight a few things you said there, which I think for some of you who may be philanthropists already or thinking of, or maybe you've inherited money or you, you are an advisor, I think some of the things, the factors you mentioned that really bring success is uh, and learnings that I've had you know, in the last 18 years is the choice of board members. That it's important when you do choose your board not to go for your friends, the people you like, those who buy into your way of thinking and your way of doing things. I don't think you'd get those kind of results if, uh, if that was the choice of, 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 uh, in terms of who gives advice. And I think one of the challenges in philanthropy is the tendency to want to get people on the board who like, who subscribe to your ideas, your way of thinking, and as a result, don't may not infuse those challenging and innovative ideas that you really need to take advantage of opportunities. Issue on, on finance. Uh, a lot of, like some of the, my friends that I have uh, uh, met from this part of the world who have inherited money, they come to me and they ask, oh, do you have anything going on maybe that we could do together? Much as I would love to access their money, it's so unstructured and you know, it's the, whatever they have in mind is not well thought out. And if the kind of thinking you've put through uh, and the use, you obviously have consulted very skilled people who give you the right uh, advice, uh, advice on structuring your, your funding. 
uh, which I, I find in some, uh, among some philanthropists, you, you don't think of uh, taking advantage of innovative tools like that to structure your funding in such a way that although it may look like for profit, the benefits and the impact is much larger than you would have if you had confined yourself to putting money into projects you like and get, getting advice from the friends that make you feel good. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing different. It's the recyclability of capital in that vein is very similar to what Fallen Rush was doing in, in the lending mm -hmm. side, right? It's just mm -hmm. the idea of kind of the same dollar can be reused again and again. So what I was going to ask you, TC, is tell us something that was disappointing as you started your philanthropic uh, journey once you had the funding in order to do it. I think for me the disappointment was me thinking I understood what the community needed and going in, I'll give an example. We, we set up, uh, a, 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 we, st we went into health because there was a health crisis. There was an outbreak of cholera and we were in a place where we could quickly I, get money, get information using the uh, mobile network to educate people on what to do, on what cholera is, how not to get it, if you have it, what to do. And we also put in money into uh, uh, doctors, nurses, to quickly to work around the clock to make sure that we minimized uh, the number of deaths. Well, after the uh, crisis, we thought, well, good idea. Let's put more money into health. Uh, let's refurbish clinics. So, you know, thinking in silos, we went off into various communities and refurbished these uh, clinics. And when you look at the clinics, they're isolated. Once we had refurbished, so what? We didn't engage the community on uh, let's do it together and discuss sustainability that once we have done the refurbishment and we, you know, we move on, what have we put in place to ensure that the, is, uh, that we, the community continues to derive benefits from uh, the clinics? So it was a, you know, a tough lesson that sometimes, you know, emotions can get in the way and sometimes you may think you really do have, you really know what the community needs, the, what the people on the ground need mm -hmm. more than they do. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Emotions do sometimes get in the way yeah. from thinking. Uh, but on the other side, I, I think that relative to innovation, it can be something relatively simple that's quite impactful. So let's think back to the ALS board meeting last year and someone comes up and says, I've got a great idea. I'm going to have people all around the United States fill ice water into a bucket <laughs> and <laughs> dump it on their head. And we're going to raise over $100 million. Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> and yet that's exactly what happened, right? So if, if for our, last year in America, all summer long, people were putting on YouTube videos of themselves dumping ice it water. It wasn't just in America, by oh, the no. way. <laughs> okay. All over the world. Even but, in Burundi, they were doing yes, that. They were. <laughs> But I think so that's something that's so simple and, and such an, an innovation you wouldn't think of. And I'm sure when the idea was first posed, it was discounted like most good ideas are. Right? But you need to kind of give those things legs and figure it out. Um, I want to shift to what I call the wake of philanthropy or the wake of good intention. Because people are often so uh, obsessed with kind of curing the ill they're trying to defeat that they miss the wake they're leaving behind. So, uh, and sometimes it creates an economic burden on those that live. So I want to talk about, for example, if you were to eradicate a disease that is currently afflicting uh, children in, in Africa, for example, the eradication of malaria or tuberculosis, which is a wonderful thing to do. But today, unless you create an economy that can sustain these lives that would have otherwise been lost to that disease, you have essentially, in the macro perspective, traded one problem for another. So you've cured the thing you were trying to cure, but if that organization's mission was just the cure and they go home, then they've left behind a surviving population that doesn't have an economic sustainability to it. So, um, Tom, how do you think about sustainability? Because a lot of these well-intentioned, often well-funded and early successes can result in something that leaves an issue for someone else. Yeah, I mean, this was something that we, we um, was absolutely at the front of our mind when we, when we first went to Africa. So, at, as a family, we'd, we'd never even been to Africa, and, and then we we travelled with President Clinton um, because the G8 was coming to our country, Scotland, and um, I became interested, but I'd, I'd never been. 
So, of course, when you travel with President Clinton, you do seven countries in six days, and it's like... Does goodness. he know Michael? Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the thing he said to me, um, and it was an amazing trip, a life-changing trip, was, Tom, always remember you, you were a guest in these countries and be the best guest that you can be. And at the time, the Millennium Development Goals were being um, sorted out. And we were on this learning curve like no other, and people wanted us to do this and do that and do the next thing. But what you talk about is what, what you leave in your wake. And, and healthcare was something I know nothing about, but people wanted us to do it. But when I sat and looked at it, I said, well, look, you want to build the clinic here? Um, and it was almost like gold plating. And I was saying, the, the community can't afford to keep this. So what happens when we exit? You're, you're actually going to create um, friction because you're, you're taking healthcare workers from here and bringing them into your gold plated clinic. And I had a very big stand up argument with one of the people who were held in the highest esteem of um, <laughs> global healthcare at the time, which was great because I knew nothing about it. But um, <laughs> um, so, but I just, I just thought, look, this, why would we do that? This is, th this is not sustainable. So when we looked and we went to Rwanda, um, we worked with a wonderful guy called Paul Farmer. And, um, and Paul and I had a great debate and I said, look, why don't we ask the government what percentage of GDP can you afford to do for healthcare? And they told us. And then I said to Paul, right, can you devise a rural healthcare system that can work on that percentage? So, <laughs> so you know, it just seemed common sense to me. Now, I know nothing about healthcare. Right. And I still know nothing about healthcare. Um, but it just seemed common sense to say, right, let's, let's ask what we can do. And, and therefore see if that's sustainable so that when we exit, because we really want to exit, I think too many NGOs want to stay in business forever. Mm. You know, mm. one, of, one of our um, key cornerstones is we want to get out. Mm. <laughs> we don't want to be there forever. And I think your analogy of, you know, if you think the business world um, is tough, try and get two non-profits to speak together. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's really tough, you know? And of course, there's egos in the way. Um, of course there are, but, you know... I, I think your point about NGOs wanting to stay around forever, or even organizations, sometimes it's a mind shift. Even in the disease-specific space, it's too off. People can't envision the cure. They're so enveloped in the fight. Yeah. And I often ask people, what, what, is that, what does success look like once it's done? And they really have not even thought about it because they're just so enamored with, I have to kill this disease, I have to fight this. Um, so I want to, so Adam, when you're thinking, you're in the more nascent stages of your, your philanthropy, how are you determining the efficacy of an organization to which you might give a grant? So part of it is just being more actively involved in the organization. So we, we tend to be very actively involved in anything we're giving to, so whether that's at the, the local level or the national or even international level, um, which gives you more information. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's not such a good thing because you start to see all the things wrong behind the curtain about the organization. In some ways, you know too much. You know about the time that X amount of money is being wasted on a particular project and you think in the back of your head, that is surprisingly the same amount that I'm giving this organization and maybe I'm knowingly wasting my money, but it's how the organization could keep sustaining itself. And I've seen this now with, uh, I'm very involved with several nonprofits, and they all have their skeletons in the closet, all of them. <laughs> and there are, the more you know, the, the more excited you get and involved with the mission, but also the more concerned you get about those skeletons and and why do you think that is? What, why do you think there are so many in the nonprofit space? Because people make mistakes. I mean, there are in the business world too, but profitability, growth, cures all ills in the for-profit world. 
you don't have that luxury in the not-for-profit world. So the way it gets shifted away is by not talking about it generally. So the more involved you are, the more likely you are to know about things that aren't normally spoken about. And that's why in the nonprofit world, uh, it, it is an interesting place to be where you're very actively involved in the organizations that you're supporting. And sometimes it, it is easier to just write a check mm -hmm. and, and hope for the best versus and, knowing the reality of what's really happening on the yeah. ground. And in, in some odd way, those 1.6 million organizations give you ample opportunity for check writing. If you look at parts of the world where there aren't the established infrastructure of NGOs even necessarily mm -hmm. tackling things. I mean, how, TC, how, how would you engage on around a cause that has no infrastructure to fund? Like, and we've spoken about that. Uh, we're, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure mm -hmm. there there to, mm -hmm. to kind of give money to even. What I found is a, an exceptional resource that we tend to overlook are uh, young, dynamic, energetic uh, uh, youth that that just need someone who can mentor them to think through the ideas, uh, craft a strategy, and put together a plan that somebody can, uh, is, can is willing to put money into. It's some it's an area I'm seriously experimenting on because I, when you say to yourself, "Well, we don't have the people with the necessary necessary structures on the ground." You ask yourself, so do I not do anything? Or do I, if, even if you sign a check, to who? So I really believe that uh, technology, uh, access to education, online courses have really empowered. We use online courses a lot, including myself. I, I'm one big uh, believer in the use of uh, using online courses to accelerate uh, your own knowledge base and to improve uh, skills, especially where the problem is um, lack of, like I said, you know, lack of uh, in, in syllabuses that are just not revised and not relevant to today's world. So uh, working, I think, empowering young people and helping to find ways of accelerating their own um, strengthening of, of, of skills to be able to answer some of those communities on the ground, I think, who is a, a, a great opportunity that uh, I think is worth um, for me putting money into research to see how that can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and do you find the same thing in Nigeria? Like, where is, is there enough infrastructure there to fund? Uh, like, do you think once you've empowered these the widows and orphans, they have ample opportunity to continue engaging? Um, there aren't enough in, uh, infras there isn't enough in, uh, infrastructure on ground at all. Uh, as I told you, it's uh, philanthropy is very, very young mm. in Nigeria. Mm. Uh, it's something that uh, everybody is just basically, you know, trying to find their feet, crea you know, being creative about to be able to um, ensure that they, they 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 meet their aims and objectives that they set at the time that they was that they were they were setting out. And one of the ones that we've been able to achieve. Um, uh, is the, the repayment of the microcredits that we give, give to them. Uh, we had to um, think deeply and come up with the idea of, uh, listen, you widows, um, if you don't repay the loans that we give you, we're going to have to stop the school fees of your children. With that, everybody started paying back. Mm -hmm. So you see, <laughs> you, you have to be creative. Uh, you would have to know where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and where you need to plug all those loopholes. Um, initially, when we started, uh, we, uh, we, we knew where all these widows live because uh, we have a list, we have files for them, but we did not have a biometric system. So we learned the hard way. We found out in the long run that when we did do the biometric system, that some weren't even widows. Um, so when we found out that some weren't even widows, some of them would say, well, what's the good of that man? He might as well just be dead. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't, he, he doesn't, so, so why shouldn't I be entitled to it? <laughs> so, um, so we were able to weed uh, like a third of our list. <laughs> 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 I think so in some communities, there are lots of widows. 
so you get wiser as you go along. So um, anyway, we thank God for where we are now. We'll continue learning. So I want to uh, shift to talent. And so, And I want to look at, particularly in the United States, because any publicly supported charity files a, what's called a Form 990, and there's a disclosure about how the organization is spending the funds that it raises. So when I'm either on the advising philanthropist side or advising organizations, the attracting talent is critical to the success and mission of an organization, yet, unlike in the for-profit sector, uh, you are judged by how little you spend on your talent. So the most complex issues on the planet, solve AIDS, go fix hunger, address poverty, get people access to capital, and, um, and then I'm going to rate you on how little you spend to attract the intellectual capital that you need to address those very complex issues. So I think it, it's an odd phenomenon, but it is one that we have to address. So you really want to attract talented people. When I ran the bank, I used to say, smart's easy. I can go to war and I, you can hire smart people all day long because you have capital to pay them and then the success is, is their further success is on their own dime. Right? So, but in the nonprofit space, it's a little bit more challenging because you're certainly competing against the for-profit arena. It costs the same for a nonprofit employee as a for-profit employee to go to Starbucks and get a coffee. So, and, and bills will mount as their children go to school just like anyone else. So I want to talk, what, what, is, what do you think about that, Adam? Because you're US-based, and how are you thinking through um, giving money to organizations? I have a lot of thoughts in this area just because our company is a leader in talent management. That's what we do as a business. So uh, we're very focused on helping organizations recruit, train, and manage their people, which often in the nonprofit world is called overhead. And so how do you deal with the disparity between the, the two groups? We actually had Dan Paletta, who's very vocal about this topic, come and speak at a corporate retreat we had in front of the whole company talking about how can we help nonprofits by focusing on, uh, on their internal operations and not so much on the programming piece of it. It's actually contradictory because on the one hand, as you know more about a nonprofit, you want your money, particularly entrepreneurs who are giving money to organizations, want their money for particular programs. And yet, as you go behind the curtain with the nonprofits, you know that they desperately need money for their general operations. And it's not about the programming. That money is easier to get than the money for staffing and managing the organization as a whole. And at the end of the day, we know all too well in the corporate world that the quality of the people you have, in addition to the market like we were talking about, is often the, the primary determinant to success or failure. And so why wouldn't that same concept apply to the nonprofit world? What I've seen in the states very recently is salaries in the nonprofit world are going up dramatically for the senior most people. And so the senior most people in the nonprofit world are starting to get, particularly for larger nonprofits, competitive salaries relative to the for-profit world, with the exception of the equity and the upside that you would get in the for-profit world. The big difference is they are demonized for it. And so there's tremendous anger and press about all the money going to pay staff and uh, really executives at these nonprofits, even though they're the ones that are going to be the difference between having minimal impact and extreme impact for whatever the objective is of that nonprofit. The current structure almost forces a barbell effect on the talent pool. So you either have young people fresh out of undergrad or grad school who will join because they want to save the world or fight a disease. And then at the end, you have people who've already made their money and can afford to come to a nonprofit and take those salaries. But you miss out on the people at the height of their career powers leveraging into an organization with their highest talent. And just one so, further point on this, just to make it more complicated, and there's a session right now on millennials and how to deal with millennials in the workforce, which by the end of this decade will be over 50% of the workforce in the Western world will be millennials. And the millennial generation absolutely wants corporate social responsibility as part of their daily life. And so you're starting to see a blur also between what job opportunities are social or socially responsible? Because you could work at a corporation that's socially responsible or a nonprofit that's socially responsible. And the challenge will be even more difficulty for the nonprofits to recruit people because it used to be a pretty polarized decision. 
I'm either going to work to make money or I'm going to help save the world. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see a blurring of the lines in those descriptions of those jobs. Right. I think something I saw, Rich, that I was speaking at um, Oxford University. And um, so these are the brightest kids. And um, I remember being struck by this one um, Indian guy. And he had an offer from Goldman Sachs. He had an offer from McKinsey. But um, in Oxford, Jeff, Jeff Skoll had built a, a school. Um, Jeff Skoll, one of the founders of eBay. And um, the school was all about you know, social responsibility, etc. And I said to him, so, so what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to go to the Jeff Skoll school. I'm turning down Goldman Sachs. And I said, wow. What, what do your mum and dad think of that? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I haven't told them that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the real talent um, has got a different agenda to my generation, your generation. And I think the real talent is going that way. And I think it's really brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I think part of our job is to make sure they have an environment in which they can excel. But I really see some of the most talented kids wanting to make a difference. Okay, great. So we have uh, just a few moments left. I wanted to at least open it to the audience uh, for any questions that you might have. Yes. Speak loudly so we can hear you. Good morning. I'm LaDon Nancy again with the Global Social Enterprise Initiative at Georgetown. And I deal with the talented young people who uh, are going into this field and struggle with that question all the time. My question for you all, though, is, um, e You've talked about investing in nonprofits. You've talked about uh, measuring their impact. You've talked a little bit about sustainability of them. But how are you helping them uh, diversify their funding streams so that they can actually be sustainable in the longer term? Well, I mean, one of the big um, things I, I said from Muhammad Yunus was um, the social business and um, something I've a young entrepreneur in Scotland came up with was a business called the Social Bite, which is a coffee shop, um, but it's a coffee shop um, that's, um, it's, first of all, it employs one in four of its workforce that are formerly homeless people, mm. and every penny of profit goes to charity. And actually, we take our Rwandan coffee and tell the story in these coffee shops. So. There, um, the, the balance is we need to make the coffee shops profitable to make them sustainable in order to do more good. So there's always this um, balance and fight between the profit, profit as a force for good. But I really see that as one of the big generational changes is that if we can take the entrepreneurial mindset and apply it to here, then we're going to get a sustainable business model that continues to deliver good. Any Yes, in the front. Thank you all. My name is Anna thompson Quay from the Gavi Alliance. First of all, I'm very impressed with all the work that you're doing. I've been in health and development for about 10, 10 years now, and this is impressive, and particularly around Mrs. Alakija, the widows and you investing in them. Um, f I'm from Ghana, so I, I know, you know uh, firsthand um, how important it is, and you're stretching them in terms of making sure that they can be more economically st sustainable and, and also investing in their children. And then um, Mrs. Masigiwa, I'm also impressed also with the way you are looking at education and technology. And there's one thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit, which is, our African generation and the innovations um, that you know our forefathers and even currently um, our new our entrepreneurs are investing in in our educational system quite a bit of that is lost you know in terms of the inventors in terms of our musicians our artists and our scientists and so now with technology as you're looking at adapting that in terms of using mobile technology how can we ensure that the next generation also understands the innovations from the continent. And as they apply their minds into the 21st and the next century, we can learn from the past and use it as, as we look into the future. And then my last question, I'm sorry, is about the talent. And 
um, you know, I've been a nonprofit and it drives me nuts. You know, there's there are no <laughs> management skills. They're very poor management skills. And um, there's a lot of money wasted on this. Right. And so, so we're, just gonna, we're just out of time. So why don't we just turn to see one? I just, just want to right? ask if the, sure. the um, you know, if the investors could turn the dialogue and invest in these NGOs so that they could also invest in their talent pool. Sorry about that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I will just quickly respond. What we are doing is we are collecting a lot of content, so not just uh, to and like I said, repackage it for uh, for our children that we give scholarships to. So it it includes so it it includes uh, things like they're not taught critical thinking at school. So we f look for opportunities in terms of what can we take that they're not taught at school, and enrich the current syllabus so that they have a much uh, uh, wide, uh, great opportunity to, you know, to, to be educated in wider issues, not just what has been put on the syllabus. Yeah. And on your other question, we created something called nonprofitready.org, which basically provides leadership training, management training, and soft skills training for nonprofit professionals. Okay. Well, thank you. A very robust topic. We could spend another hour, but unfortunately our session's over. So I want to thank all the panelists. Thank you.